I close my, my eyes at the end of the day and I see queen bees. <laughs> you know, I hear buzzing as I fall asleep at night. I, I really couldn't do anything else. I was thinking it would be fun to, when I, if I build another house, to make s intentional spaces in, all, in between all the floor joists and have the beehives right in the side of the house. And I could have a cover from inside. And as long as you opened all the windows, you could open, the, open up the hives and work on them right in your house and you could heat your house with bees. <laughs> I have no other social life. <laughs> they keep you, the animals keep you very busy. <laughs> Aren't this great evidence of how dangerous they are? Huh? <laughs> there's a queen, there's workers. They've got food in there, but there's not enough workers in there to guard that hive and keep us out. So we're going in and they will barrage another hive and rob it out and kill that hive, not kill the individuals, although they will kill the individuals, there will be fights and there will be a mortality, but they kill that hive by taking every single bit of food and pollen that they had stored in this hive and take it back to their hive. Bees are capable of that, they do it. I saw it happen last week at one of my hives. They wiped it out. There's a little strip of woods up here, and then uh, just the field that you see, and uh, bordered by the trees down here and along the road. And um, this is just sort of the main place, and then I'm starting to have other yards around the area. That my idea was to eventually have a, hi a, a group of 20 or 30 hives every uh, mile or so in Columbia County, which, you know, I'll never have that many. I got started in farming by taking a, a, a roundabout route. I didn't start out to be a farmer at all. But back in the 70s, I certainly was bit by the back to the land movement. Um, really hated the thought of industrial food. Um, had grown up upstate, went to the city, went to college, um, but decided to move back to the country. Rented the places for a few while and then decided to buy a home. And I wanted to live in an agricultural community. I thought it would be good to be a part-time farmer. I was very interested in the idea of keeping bees and um, found this piece of land. It was sandwiched between two working dairy farms overlooking this beautiful valley and there were other dairy farms out there too. And uh, moved here in 1979 and immediately got bees. The amazing experience I've ever had with bees is walking into my first bee yard and before I got my veil on I was stung five times in the neck. <laughs> you know, and uh, throughout the course of the uh, the year uh, getting stung constantly, which is really unavoidable, especially when you're first starting with bees. You're still clumsy with your fingers and you don't know how to move like fluid you know, already and you get stung constantly. And it was that that I had a lot of days asking myself, uh, I don't know if I can do this and <laughs> I don't know if this is right for me, but sticking with it and, you know, suddenly I was, uh, you know, one of the only people my age who had an interest in continuing with it. Bees aren't selfish, people are selfish. You know, all the bees that you see flying in and out of here now, they're working their tails off, going collecting nectar, collecting pollen, bringing it back. They're not going to benefit any of it. They're not going to make it to the winter. They're going to die before the winter. They're not going to live over the winter. They're doing all of this so that the queen and a few bees that are raised later in the fall can survive over the winter long enough so that they can raise some more bees in the spring. And they're doing it for their hive in that way, but they're also doing it for the flowers because they need to be pollinated. When I uh, purchased my house, a colony of bees living in the wall of the building. So I said, okay, and I called an exterminator that was there in 10 minutes who fumigated the bees and killed them. But then the next day I went and pulled the wall board off of the wall where the bees were in the wall and there were tens of thousands of dead bees. And I felt very ill about having killed all these bees so that winter I bought a beehive and ordered a package of bees and started keeping bees to pay them back for what I had done to them. There's nothing less like anarchy than what happens inside a beehive, you know, everything's organized, there's the queen, there's the drones, there's the workers, everybody has exactly their job. Keeping bees is a good way to separate out the men that you're interested in to the ones that you've got no use for <laughs> when you're dating. And uh, my husband passed the test. Uh, when we were dating, he, uh, he sometimes works on the night shift. 
and uh, he was sleeping in the afternoon at my house. And I woke him up and said, there's a swarm of bees we need to catch. Come on. Um, so I had an extra suit, uh, put the suit and veil and gloves on him and brought him outside and said, up in that tree, see? And about 20 feet high in this big oak tree was a big swarm of bees. And I said, what we need to do is one of us needs to go up the tree, shimmy out on the branch, put their hands around the branch and knock the swarm of bees into a big cardboard box that the person on the ladder under it will be holding. Which job do you want to do? <laughs> and I promise you, the bees aren't interested in you. They're not going to bother you. They're not going to sting you. He said, okay, I'll go out on the branch. And he did. He went up on the ladder, went out on the branch. I got on the ladder with the box. It went in there, did it. Got down with the box, put the bees uh, in a hive, and it was done. And um, I thought, this is great. <laughs> he believes me. He trusted me. He was willing. He had never done anything with bees before. And he said, you know, if Carol said it was going to be so, I'm going to do it. I thought, all right. <laughs> I married him. No, 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 let go Archery. See that bear up there? That's uh, one of the uh, one of the things that the colonies can't handle. Is a bear. They can handle almost anything. Uh, you know, like skunks and so on and so forth. But when a bear gets there, there's just no, no handling. So there's only one thing to do with a bear, and that's uh, uh, is to shoot it, get rid of it. But an animals aren't the, really the same as people. Animals don't. Of course, we take care of our animals too, and we don't want them to die. But, but the an the animals don't mind so much if they die. To me, it's, it's almost a golden opportunity because having those 10 hives left or 100 hives left or whatever you have left, it's, uh, it's worth losing all the others because you got those ones left and you know those ones didn't die. So you can use the genetics from those to start raising more queens that are potentially going to be resistant to this, this new disease or this new circumstance. Whatever killed the others, it didn't kill those. I've had people come in and do me harm, knock over colonies and this kind of stuff. Yeah. Not nice. <laughs> there was a period in time when bees were, for the most part, kept by the clergy. In, in uh, the, way, the way farming used to be and the way beekeeping used to be is that there always were bees on every farm. Everybody just had some bees. And so it didn't need to be economic. And it didn't really matter if you made money at it or not. You just had your bees, and when you had a little time, you'd do something with the bees. And so it was all part of a whole picture, and you got your honey and enough honey for the neighbors, and maybe you sold a little honey, but it wasn't, you know, the, the whole idea of having an animal or some, a living being and making it into an economic factor isn't the way life is intended to be, and that's part of the problem with the bees. They're not... They're not treated as living beings, they're treated as economic factors or machines or implements towards making money and that it, they're not suited to that. They sting you a few times till you go away and continue to go away, then they'll go back to their hive. They don't follow you for a mile stinging you. But under the same pretense of they smell a fair amount of fear, I have absolute love for the bees and they smell that too. People ask about colony collapse, well what that's what everybody asks when they hear about bees. It's so much in the news. Well, what do, what do you think about colony collapse or what is going on? And, and I, I just sort of say, well, if you do everything wrong that you possibly could do wrong for about 100 years, eventually the bees will die. And so that leaves 
that leaves me a whole lot of room to do a few things right. If, and so if you, if you mistreat the bees uh, one year, it's not a problem. The bees will still be fine. If you do it two years, it won't be a problem. But maybe after 30 years or 40 years or 50 years or 100 years, however long it's been, the bees just don't have the energy or the stamina or the resistance to bounce back after all that time. So everybody in the scientific world is looking for a new thing. What's the new virus? What's the new thing? What's, what is it? Well, we've been doing that for 30 years and we know that works. So what is it that's new? Why are the bees dying now? And that's, to me, a very short-sighted view because the problem isn't a new thing. The problem is we've been doing all these things wrong too long. It's what actually what humans have been doing with bees probably since the very beginning of humans, the keep, keeping of bees, which goes back to at least several thousand years. It's, it's recorded in the in reliefs in uh, Egyptian temples where people were clearly beekeeping and packing honey and send, shipping honey off. But even back then, humans were in their own way modifying the bee. They were selecting the colonies that were the most gentle or the most productive for honey. And now we're, we're intensifying that process. We're selecting, uh, using more sophisticated genetic tools bringing, making new combinations, bringing genetic material together, bees from different, uh, strains of honeybees from different part of, parts of the world together, importing bees. Um, we've accelerated the whole process and, and that's commensurate with the accelerated ecological changes that we're creating. I know exactly what CCD is and you can quote me on it. It is a physical manifestation of the rift between us and our ecosystem. It's, uh, it takes its shape in, in many forms. Um, mostly present is this idea that we can control our own environment and control the way that we grow food and control, uh, and create an entirely fabricated food production system. And that's not the way that things work. We're discovering that now we have to cart bees across the country to provide pollination for the crops that we're growing in monocultures. We have to keep those crops alive by using a whole line of pesticides most recently, the systemic neonicotines uh, have just been destroying insect populations. Um, and it just shows up in parts per billion inside the hive, in the pollen levels. And that's all it takes to compromise honeybee health. So you get a crop like blueberries in Maine, and you get a crop like almonds in California, and uh, they produce it in huge quantities that is then distributed all over the country. And either you do without almonds uh, or you do it this way because you can't grow almonds in New York in your backyard. And in order to grow these crops, uh, you have to have pollinators. And with huge acreages, there's no way the native wild pollinators the, uh, can handle that. So commercial bees uh, have to be brought in by uh, a big beekeeping uh, businesses and uh, uh, if the beekeepers stop doing that, American agriculture collapses. <laughs> when I lost all these bees uh, there, I uh, tried to uh, figure out now what do we do, you know? What, what, how do I bring these things back? What, how can I help these creatures? Money. Money is at the base of everything that is gone that's taking us into an abyss. That Rudolf Steiner thought of all the bees as having sort of like a group soul, you know, and that and if, see, if you did something wrong to your bees here, that negatively influences all the bees in the world. It doesn't just, you know, inf it's the same like if you cut off your toe, it's, you know, it, it's detrimental to your foot and to the rest of your toes, but it also affects your whole body. It doesn't just affect your toe. It's basically the idea that a colony is a unit of function, a kind of organism or super organism. In some sense, the term's a little unfortunate because it sounds like superman, like an extreme form of a human being or supermarket, a great market. We're not saying it's a great organism. What we're saying is, it's, it's actually, we're saying that a colony of bees is, is a unit of biological organization above the level of the, of the organism, but it is a unit of function. So that, <laughs> that's, that's the idea. And it's, 
I think there's, it's part of the fascination of that is that it's part, these bees illustrate a key piece of the evolution of life. Life started out as single-celled life, really as very simple cells. Then it built more, what we call bacterial or prokaryotic cells. Societies of those came together to build more sophisticated cells. Societies of cells came together to build multicellular organisms like ourselves. These insect societies show us the latest stage of that integration to build a new higher level unit. Individual insects have built societies into these functioning units of colonies. So that's, that's the key idea of the superorganism, that it represents really perhaps the highest level of, of biological organization that there is. Just like our food supply. That's another item right there. Boy, that, that's a, one of the scariest things that I can, I can, I can imagine, is that uh, we could be starving like a lot of the African countries. Man, and it's, it's possible. Well, for one thing, as you're talking about climate change, uh, that's affecting the West terribly. Uh, we've got these. If we don't do something with these creatures here uh, and get them back doing their job and working for us, we're going to lose out there. We already have. We already are. I don't know if you're aware of the almond crop in, uh, in California. They got big bees in from New Zealand and Australia. And due to, and due to that fact, they're bringing in other uh, diseases and uh, Lord knows what else that they're doing. So th these are the kind of things that uh, that's scary. To me, at least it's scary. And uh, it's not good for our future, I don't think. We've got to uh, look at things entirely different. We're, we're right now in a crisis. We're in an energy crisis. That's one of the, uh, one of the disasters that we've got. Uh, and we came into that so quick. And the food could be the same way. Food could be the same way. Bees pollinate the legumes, the clovers, the trefoil, the alfalfa, and the legumes are what fix the nitrogen in the soil. So the legumes have a higher protein level, pull up more minerals because they have deeper roots, and it creates a more nutritious pasture for the animals. At the same time, those plants are fixing nitrogen in the soil and make the other grasses, they work like a fertilizer for the other grasses. So your entire pasture is richer for having abundant bees around. And it has to be recognized that without the bee, all we'll have is corn and grain. The food production and distribution system that we have developed in the past century has become so energy in uh, intensive and requires so much manipulations and so much chemical use that it really can't continue on the level it, it, it's at. I mean, people that are growing food right now, we're, we're ahead of the game and we're going to be uh, what we say is going to go. But. Uh to change our whole country into eating things that are grown within 100 miles. I think that's a utopian scheme that, that I don't know how many people are willing to go back to the diet uh, of the 1920s, uh, you know, where uh, you made sauerkraut and uh, you made uh, all your home canned fruits and vegetables and jellies and everything else. and. Uh, you either grew it yourself or you bought it from somebody in your county who grew it. Uh, but uh, people in those generations died young. To, to be able to go out in the world and, and uh, fix things, and, and there's a lot of ways to approach that. And you, there's lobbyists who go out and they you know lobby for change and trying to fix things in the government and fix problems that that are happening around and there are people who do documentaries <laughs> and try to get it out there so that the world can really see what's going on and implement change that way and I just kind of want to just I'm just going to live my own life and do things that I think are right and implement change in a small way just by my neighbors and the people who see what's going on and and uh, I don't I don't feel like I have to try to prove anything to the whole world all at once Think about the bees. What do you think? <laughs> I don't hate it. <laughs> I don't care about it.
about them either way. <laughs> they're stingers <laughs> are pain when they sting you. <laughs> That's just all that he talks about is bees. So. He's just always saying, oh, he has <laughs> to go get more sugar <laughs> water, or he has to go fix the beehive. We're making water, teas, water. we're making tea. We got so. two free turkeys because um, cause my dad got so much sugar. Let's fall. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good thing about the bees, right? Yeah. <laughs>